Hi there, everyone. My name is Prerak Juthani. I'm a doctor in internal medicine, and I'm finishing up my third year of internal medicine residency, and I'll be a hospitalist. I've been creating videos like this to provide a simple approach to very common diseases that we see inside the hospital. Videos like this are intended to provide you a 360 degree overview of everything about the condition, because this is something that impacts a lot of patients, but more importantly, if you're a medical student, pre-med, or even an early stage resident, a lot of the stuff I'm gonna go over here will show you how to manage patients with cirrhosis. So today, um, the, the goal is for you to understand the pathophysiology of cirrhosis, for you to understand how to treat cirrhosis, and I'm gonna give you a perfect mnemonic so that you will never miss anything whenever you're taking care of a cirrhotic patient. <clears throat> Before I begin, you can already see that the underlying pathophysiology of cirrhosis is already shown here. Some trigger causes excessive inflammation in your liver, whether that's hepatitis A, hepatitis B, maybe you also have been drinking alcohol. That then leads to a fatty liver versus liver fibrosis. And once you have irreversible fibrosis in your liver, that's known as cirrhosis. It's basically end stage liver disease. With that being said, the talk that I'm going to give to you today is going to be an amalgam of all the things that I have learned from my colleagues. So this is not something I came up with on my own. Actually, Josh Norman, who is one of the incredible um, co-residents I work with, who is going to be a GI fellow next year, is the one who taught me some of this stuff. Ethan Morris is another one of my co-residents. And Atut Patil, who was actually a chief resident in internal medicine about four years ago at Stanford, um, is where I got a lot of this management pearls. So I just want you to know, like a lot of the stuff we learn is from other people. And the whole goal is to give back and to kind of create a circular chain of knowledge. With that being said, what exactly is cirrhosis? I already told you, uh, cirrhosis is essentially end-stage liver disease. It's chronic liver disease that's characterized by diffuse fibrosis, and that then leads to the formation of regenerative nodules, which can lead to distortion of the liver architecture and impaired liver function. What happens when your liver isn't working well? When, when you have a cirrhotic liver, the liver will not essentially function. And you may know that the liver is involved in making albumin. It's also involved in making clotting factors. And because you're not making albumin anymore, and because you're not making as many clotting factors anymore, you're more likely to have coagulopathies as well as edema because you lose the oncotic pressure that you would have gotten from the albumin. The second thing that can happen when your liver is not working, um, the liver is often the place where ammonia is detoxified. And so whenever you don't have a liver working well, the ammonia levels can build up and that can lead to hepatic encephalopathy or altered mental status. And the last thing is you also have increased infection risk if you have cirrhosis, such as spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. To make sure that whenever you approach a patient with cirrhosis that you're going through all of the nuances, the way I like to remember the management is called the VIBES mnemonic, V-I-B-E-S. Remember that? We're going to come back to that throughout this video. With that being said, um, before I get into the management of cirrhosis, I want you to also understand that one of the reasons why cirrhosis causes so much like odd side effects is because cirrhosis essentially creates a traffic jam in the liver. That traffic jam in the liver makes it harder for blood to get through the liver. So blood then backs up and that's known as portal hypertension. When your liver can compensate for this blood backing up, it means that you have compensated cirrhosis and you don't often have symptoms of cirrhosis. So now I told you to remember the mnemonic VIBES, V-I-B-E-S. That will then tell you everything you need to know about cirrhosis. Vibes, the first letter is a V. What does that stand for? It stands for volume. When someone has cirrhosis, I told you it causes a traffic jam in the liver. The portal vein has increasingly higher pressures. Those pressures lead to essentially fluid leaking out of your blood vessels into your abdominal cavity and sometimes even having varices, which are engorged veins that we talked about. When you have these ascites um, and the fluid in your belly, one of the best ways to remove that is through something called Lasix and um, spironolactone. So Lasix is a diuretic, spironolactone is a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. And the way you do this is you often give Lasix of 40 milligrams and spironolactone of 100. Um, when you give this to these patients, they can often help with the ascites, but it also helps with overall volume management. Similarly, another thing that we will do for patients who have excessive ascites, aka fluid in the belly, we actually put a needle in and drain some of that fluid known as a paracentesis. Uh, when you have a ther paracentesis, you want to replete around 25 grams of albumin for every four liters removed because that's a very large amount of fluid. So that's the V in cirrhosis. The next thing in cirrhosis is known as an I, which is known as infection. Patients with cirrhosis are much more likely to get infections because their immune system is a little immunocompromised. The biggest place where they can get an infection is known as spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. This is again because you have so much ascites and fluid around your belly, and that can often 
get infected with um, bacterial translocation from your gut. The way you know you have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is you tap that fluid, and if there's more than 250 poly, uh, PMNs is what we call them, that's diagnostic of SBP. You often need to give ceftriaxone to cover for SBP, and then you also need to often give albumin to help with short-term survival and renal function. If at any point one of your patients has SBP, they will need to be on SBP prophylactic antibiotics for essentially the rest of their life because they're at very high risk of getting it again. SBP often has a very high mortality rate because it can lead to things called hepatorenal syndrome and things like that. But just remember, if someone has an underlying cirrhosis, the I stands for infection, and the infection means that you should often check and see if they have a history of SBP or if you want to rule it out, especially if they have altered mental status. Now we can move on to the B. What does the B in VIBE stand for? The B stands for bleeding. Patients with cirrhosis don't make any of your coagulation factors anymore, aside from one, which is kind of an exception. But majority of your coagulation factors are made in the liver. Because you cannot make those anymore, you are very high risk of bleeding because coagulation is the opposite of bleeding. And if you don't have any coagulation factors, you're not likely to coagulate and therefore you're more likely to bleed. Um, so because of that, these patients can bleed in a lot of different ways, but specifically if they have varices in their esophagus due to the portal hypertension, those can be likely to bleed. You can have gastric varices that can cause bleeding. And so you often want to make sure you're collect correcting coagulopathy by checking their INR and making sure it's below 2. You often also want to make sure their hemoglobin stays above 7. Even though these patients are more likely to bleed, they can actually still be pro-coagulopathic. And the reason for this is, again, because you have a very high inflammatory state. So I do still continue some of these patients on sub-Q heparin or Lovenox for uh, DVT prophylaxis. And last but not least, well, technically we have two more. The E stands for encephalopathy. Patients are not going to metabolize ammonia as well when they have cirrhosis because that's where ammonia is metabolized. That increases the likelihood that you actually get hepatic encephalopathy because ammonia levels can build up. So you can use lactulose and rifaximin and titrate to about three to four bowel movements a day to help decrease the risk of hepatic encephalopathy. If you're ever concerned about hepatic encephalopathy, you should also make sure that the patient does not have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which can also be a trigger. And oftentimes, um, you can get a pneumonia level. People, pay, people say not to check an ammonia level if you're worried about encephalopathy, but a negative ammonia, like a normal ammonia, can be uh, very good because it makes over hepatic encephalopathy uh, less likely to be the underlying cause for a patient's uh, mental status. And last but not least, S in the VIBES mnemonic stands for screening. Patients who have ascites um, and also if they have varices, they need to have an EGD at least one to, every one to two years. Patients with cirrhosis need to be screened for hepatocellular carcinoma every six to 12 months with a, either an ultrasound or a CT scan. They often need to have an AFP level that can be drawn. And then they often need to be up to date on their flu, pneumococcal, hepatitis A, and hepatitis B vaccines. Just remember, going sequentially, you always want to think about volume with Lasix and spironolactone. Then you want to think about infection with more than 250 PMNs. Then you want to think about bleeding, uh, specifically upper GI bleeding with variceal bleeding. You want to think about encephalopathy with lactulose and refraximin, and of course, screening. If you like this video, please drop a like, comment, share, subscribe. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.